Thank you very much. I'd like to draw your attention to this recent uh, number of arthroscopy, the December issue, where the question of latachés and uh, arthroscopic latachés is very thoroughly discussed. And I point out three of the papers that you can find there that I really recommend you read. They're, it's very interesting. I will very, very briefly, uh, I will just skip these slides because the former speaker told everything about the Latache procedure and the history about that. We know what we are trying to do. I just uh, jumped to the arthroscopic Latache, which was first uh, popularized by uh, Laurent Lafosse in 2005, and then later by Pascal Boileau in 2008. It's a little uh, variation in their techniques, and the initial technique of Boileau was more kind of a Bristow procedure. Now he has more a uh, Latache procedure, but with Instead of screws, he use, he use um, these uh, buttons, as you know. Uh, both of these uh, uh, inventors of, the, of the, uh, the procedure have revised their procedures on multiple locations after the first announcement. And what we need to know is that there have been reported numerous complications. Some of them have not been reported, uh, and some of them very seriously, very serious. Actually, a nerve transaction is a disaster and has been reported. Uh, treatment of shoulder instability at my uh, hospital, Oslo University Hospital, it's about 100 surgeries a year. The majority of the patients uh, are treated with the Bankart or a Bankart plus remplissage. The problems, however, we encounter are young males in contact sport, recurrent dislocations after former surgery, the hyperlax patients, patients with significant glenoid bone loss, and those patients who have deficiencies in the soft tissues. I call it insufficient ligament labrum complex. They're also a major uh, problem. What are the uh, possible theoretical advantages of arthroscopic versus open technique? Well, uh, a French study showed that the only difference they could find was that the patients had less pain postoperatively. You may suspect that or, or expect that there will be less scarring uh, and less external rotational defects. Uh, it's an arthroscopic procedure, so uh, per definition, there would be lower postoperative infection rates. The hope was that the graft positioning would be more precise to avoid osteoarthritis. And another thing which is rare because these uh, things uh, is rare between females, but, but cosmetics with a big scar in the shoulder uh, is not what a young lady wants. So those ladies we have operated have been very happy with the small arthroscopic scars. The disadvantage with arthroscopic technique is that it's technically difficult. In most hands, it takes longer operating time. There is a risk of severe complications in, if there is a lack of technical skills. And uh, insufficient uh, fixation has been a problem with some of the current devices. So we started out in Oslo uh, after many years of doubt. We finally decided we would start and we started uh, three years ago. We decided to evaluate the process very thoroughly and limit the surgery to two operating surgeons. We wanted to register the operating time. We did a pre, post, and one year follow-up CT scan. And we do the VOSIS and constant score pre-op and one year follow-up. And we also uh, designed a scoring system for graft positioning. A few technical issues. Uh, positioning and portal placement. We like to do this in beach chair. I think it's easier to do this operation in beach chair, although it has been described, it can be done also in, in uh, lateral decubitus. What we have done uh, in our hospital due to our anesthesiologist is that we start out with only the first part of the operation when we have the arthroscope in the posterior portal in beach chair. And after that, we turn the patient down to supine position. This means that we can lower the blood pressure and theoretically we have less uh, bleeding and we have less risk of uh, um, 
hypooxidation uh, um, to the brain, uh, uh, injury to the brain because of low, too low blood pressure and too low oxidase. So this is the position we use. I've lined out the portals we use. They are the same as described in the original technique with six anterior portals and one posterior portal, as you can see on this picture here. Uh, first step is preparation of the capsule and subscap. There are debates ongoing if you should, uh, if you should uh, take the capsule away, like La Fosse does, or if you should uh, keep the capsule there and suture it back at the end. The final answer to this is not yet there, so the jury is still out on this issue. We follow the La Fosse technique and take away the capsule and, and visualize the uh, uh, joint side of the subscap to identify the level of the split. We also put a marker, as you can see here, on the cartilage at the three o'clock position so that we can uh, have an idea where to put the graft at the later stage of the operation. Then we try to prepare the bed on the scapular neck uh, to have some cancellous bone for the bone block to heal back to. Next, next part is the uh, development of the subpectoral space and the portal placement and the pectoral is minor release. It's very interesting to find that you can also, we thought we could only do atroscopy in a contained environment that's inside a joint, which is for sure not true. You can easily extend atroscopy to other non-contained environments and you can have a good vision and, and, uh, and a good overview of the, whole, of the whole area. So here you can see on the on the upper uh, left picture, here's the, here's the coracoid process and the conjoint tendon, and we have developed the subdeltoid space here. Underneath here, we put in three needles, which marks the three anterodistal portals. And here you can see the split where we take the uh, pec minor off the medial side of the coracoid process. Then comes the preparation of the coracoid. You really need to take off the soft tissue to really visualize the bone so that you are sure that your tunnels are placed in the correct position with sufficient bone each side. Further on preparation of the coracoid, we make a fracture uh, weakening uh, uh, with a chisel so that we can harvest the coracoid process with a clean cut. We drill the holes and we use uh, <coughs> top hats. Uh, we change, in, the early, in the beginning we had top hats in both holes. Uh, we stopped doing that and only now in the distal hole. I come back to why we did that. Uh, next, which is very, very important, <coughs> is then the visualization of the neural structures. First, we always visualize the musculocutaneous nerve, which you can see here. Here is the coracoid process. You do the, uh, take off the, the pec minor, and right underneath there you find the musculocutaneous nerve. I think it's very important with this arthroscopic technique that you visualize the nerves. Then second, after we have osteotomized, uh, osteotomized we, take, uh, we go and find the axillary nerve which is also very important because you will see when you create the uh, split in the subscap, sometimes you end up very close to the axillary nerve and you need to have this visualized when you make the split. This is then the split preparation. We use the traditional technique with a switching stick from behind at the pre-dissected uh, uh, area in the subscap. Uh, and we visualize uh, that we can see that the axillary nerve is protected from, from uh, the stick. And then we make the, uh, the split with a radio frequency device. We try to stay in the, in the muscle. This is what we want to achieve. We want to have a bone graft that is situated between two and five o'clock position that has uh, bicortical screw fixation and is never 
uh, more lateralized than the joint line. Especially this is very important. And if you see a small detail here, uh, you can see that the actual the erosion is not at a 90 degree angle to the joint line. So that leaves us with the option should we take away the bone that's there to have it parallel to or 90 degrees to the joint line or should we just prepare, leave that and have this position? Because if you put it on the existing uh, uh, erosion surface, you will definitely be prone. You will have a, lat a graft that is placed too lateral, and that is, in many cases, a disaster. That will lead to osteoarthritis. So we tend to be rather a little bit medial than too lateral. That's very, very important. <coughs> but this case is probably also within the limits of what can be accepted. Whereas this case, you can see it's a little bit prone, but if you calculate the normal uh, depth of the cartilage and see that it's only uh, two millimeters prone, it's probably not uh, uh, prone to the actual cartilage and the joint line. But this is a uh, thing you need to be focused on. Sometimes it's not perfect. Here, one case, a young lady, where uh, there was a huge defect and a small graft, and the standard screws were way too long. So they are protruding more than one centimeter uh, out on the back. And this caused problem, and we had to remove the screws later on, after it healed. And uh, 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 the other case here, you can see there is some, some resorption of the, of the proximal part of the graft. This is another case where you uh, can see there is uh, apparently a loose inferior screw because there is a tunnel widening. And uh, there again you can see the case with resorption on the uh, cranial part of the graft. So what are the results in our series? We've done now a total of 69 cases. We have not have, not in any single case we have had to change our plans. We have done and gone through the arthroscopic procedure in every single case. Uh, the operating time for the first cases, uh, the first five cases of the two operating surgeons was a mean of 157 minutes. At midterm, we checked and we went, we had 124 minutes. And then we checked again the last cases, again, five cases of each surgeon, and the mean operating time is 125 minutes. So you see, we haven't made any progress uh, during the latter the 30 cases when it comes to operating time. Uh, what about the uh, results of WOSI score? These are preliminary results because we don't have follow-up of the whole series at one year yet. But we had, uh, the first patients had a WOSI score pre-op of 48. Uh, uh, the midterm patients, which we have followed up, had 46. Post-op, 78 and 80. And the difference, 30 and 34. So you see, not really a big change. So that seems, it seems that the, uh, uh, these results are pretty good uh, compared to uh, the results from the Norwegian Instability Registry published in ACTA uh, some years ago, where they had, uh, this was bank art repair, primary cases, 51 pre-op and uh, 75 post-op. Uh, revision cases, 48 and uh, 64 respectively. And remember, many, about half of the cases we do Latache are revision cases. So we think our results are pretty good. Uh, and uh, it seems that the change from the early patients to the uh, later patients is that we do it a little bit quicker, but we, even in the beginning, we were doing it sufficiently and we were doing it in the right way. So, what are the results summarized? Um, we ha definitely have extended operating time compared to open surgery. 
We have uh, high WOSI scores as one year. Uh, cosmetics are improved, in, at least for the females, they, they appreciate this. I'm not so sure about less pain. Uh, I think pain is a very difficult thing to, to judge. It's so individual. And you probably know the publication where they asked patients who were undergoing uh, a rotator cuff repair, and they tried to find any uh, um, connections between the procedure, the number of anchors, the size of the tear, and the post-operative pain and function, and the only relation they could find was that those patients who preoperatively reported they have a very high pain threshold, they had much, much more pain postoperative than any other. So pain is a difficult thing to judge. Uh, we've had no serious complications. Uh, three patients we had to reoperate. Uh, they have all been successful. Two of them due to stiffness. They were the early series, and one due to malposition, position graft and screws. We have had five graft fixation failures. Two were detected immediately post-operatively and successfully reoperated. Uh, one was detected at one year follow-up with very good function and was stable. And two patients, one at four and one at 10 weeks. The first at four weeks was a patient with uh, very difficulty with controlling his epileptic disease. So he has repeated seizures. And as you know, no, uh, no surgical reconstruction technique is stronger than a seizure. The other one went snowboarding uh, a steep mountainside at uh, 10 weeks. This was not according to our recommendations. And he fell, had a high velocity injury and re-dislocated and broke the graft. What have we learned? Well, we have learned that the subscapularis split should not be placed too high. In the beginning, we were they told us we should put it between the upper and the middle third, which is apparently not the correct position. You should have it between the middle and the lower third, at least in the lower part of the middle third. Uh, we have no top hat in the proximal hole because we see quite regularly that there is some resorption of the proximal part of the graft. And then it's easy to remove just the screw. If there's also a top hat there, it's more complicated. We haven't had to do this, but it's a, a topic of concern. Uh, avoid too distal position of holes in the coracoid because it's difficult to decide where's the tendon, where's the end of the coracoid, and you can break out if you're too distal. So better move a couple of millimeters proximal. And then, uh, technically, uh, drill the distal hole in the scapular neck aided by the plastic guide before graft is passed through the split. That is very helpful for moving the graft in there and also preparing the graft before you fix it. I cannot overemphasize how important visualization and working conditions is if you start out doing operations like this. There was earlier today a picture of a complete red out like this guy has. When he's looking around, he has a complete red out, which is the most feared complication of an arthroscopic surgeon. Whereas this guy has a good overview, good working condition, and can helm his ship to a safe harbor. So visibility and working condition means controlled bleeding, meticulous hemostasis with the RF probe, hypotensive anesthesia, cerebral perioperative oximetry, and an excellent arthroscopy pump are all mandatory. For the portals, exact positioning of portals is very important. High number of ports, you need seven at least and you have to minimize fluid leakage. Thank you very much.